Okay. Okay, I have started recording. So welcome to our next tutorial, which in a mm -hmm. sense will be a continuation of my previous introductory talk. Um, our uh, PhD student Matt Bright will talk about easily computable metrics on the space of isometry classes of lattices. Please, Matt. Yes. So uh, yes, as as Vitaly has mentioned, we're looking at uh, at both in, uh, at, uh, at lattice invariance, um, invariance just of lattice structures. And I'll, I'll go into that in detail um, in a, in in a little while. Uh, and and again, looking for kind of continuous continuous metrics um, on the space of lattices. And we're doing this. Uh, hopefully, the slide has just changed. Um, uh, we're doing this uh, because we care about periodic structures because they turn up all over the place. And we've talked obviously about crystals, um, three uh, as, as periodic structures, but we can also think of textiles and sort of biomolecules. And the, a key datum of them is, is the underlying lattice. So if we have a periodic structure, then there's this group of translations, which uh, there's a group of, of translations which map it to itself. And the thing that we we sort of talk about lattices, and lattices are very very simple objects, really, uh, to to describe. Um, so we can just take any basis in R n, any linearly independent basis, and uh, and then take all the integer combinations of the of the basis vectors, and there we have a lattice. Um, now, since uh, there's, we're gonna, there's a bit of kind of sloppiness in notation here, which people will, will notice as we go on, uh, we, can, we can always kind of translate this lattice so that there's one lattice vector at the origin. And the useful thing about that um, is that then we can think of a lattice, lattice in two different ways. We can think of it either as the vectors, the basis vectors and integer combinations of them, or we can think of it as kind of points living at the end of the vectors. Um, and uh, and the two are kind of exchangeable in their representation. So we're going to be a bit sloppy about putting arrows over things in notation and the like. We're going to talk about v uh, as as being kind of a vector or a point at the end of the vector that is it's a point of the lattice. But either way, you have a discrete point set entirely defined by a set of linearly independent basis vectors. And most of the diagrams are going to be um, as, as they were in the earlier talks in two dimensions, uh, mainly because this is rather easy to see, um, although there are some three dimensional diagrams later. So as Vitaly has mentioned, our problem is that we want to develop an isometry invariant on the space of equivalence classes of lattices. Isometry equivalence classes, well, I mean, we will talk about um, precisely what kind of equivalences we want to avoid uh, as we go on. But essentially, if we have a space of equivalence classes of lattices, we want to define a distance. And we want that distance to satisfy uh, the standard metric axioms, which, uh, which a lot of you will be, most of you will be familiar with. We want two lattices uh, to um, be equal to zero. We want the distance between two lattices to be equal to zero, if and only if they're in the same equivalence class. Um, there are metrics which, there are, dist there are things which don't do this, uh, and they're called pseudometrics, uh, but, uh, but ideally we, want, we, we, we don't want to have non-zero distances between lattices that we are considering as it were the same. Uh, we want it to be symmetric, we want this obviously like, and like the distance between two points and we want to satisfy the triangle inequality, we want the distance, the sort of straight line distance as it were between two objects to be um, at least um, as long as the distance, um, to be at least as long as the distance that where you kind of go via another object. Again, you can, these are all just things that extend in a, in a general sense the idea of distances between points in space. But what we also want it to be, which is not a metric axiom, um, is, as Vitaly has mentioned, continuous. Um, it's important to us uh, that if we move, uh, if, we, if we perturb one of the basis vectors in a lattice, say, very slightly, we want the distance between the lattice and the perturbed lattice to be small, to be, uh, to be small. And as we make that perturbation smaller and smaller, we want in a kind of classical continuous sort of analysis sense uh, for the uh, distance between uh, those two lattices to shrink to zero. And the reason this is an open problem is that while it's very easy to describe a lattice, lattices are surprisingly slippery to, cl to classify. And one of the obvious uh, reasons for this 
well, that, that has been discussed is that we can describe a lattice in an infinite number of ways. For a start, as I've mentioned, we can move it around in the plane, and that includes things like rotation. So I can take an ordinary lattice like this with a couple of basis vectors, uh, one zero minus one one, and here I can um, I can kind of just rotate it a bit, um, and it's kind of hopefully this is a. I mean, even, perhaps it might even be hard to see. Uh, that this is the, the same lattice, but it is. And if all you've got to go on is the information with the basis vectors, it certainly isn't intuitive that it's the same lattice. But also we have the other problem, which is that we can pick any, we can pick a huge number of basis vectors and uh, we, well, we can pick an infinite number of possible basis, uh, basis vectors giving rise to the same lattice. And the way to think of that is it's, it's actually a group of it, it's integer linear transformations with uh, with a determinant one. So it's from this this group uh, in uh, so n by n integer coefficient matrices with with a determinant one. And this is kind of a group with some with sort of lots of interesting structure that people have uh, have explored in different dimensions. So already we've got kind of this ambiguity, you know, you can, and again, you, if you, all you've got to go on is the basis vectors, well, you might here be able to have a go at thinking that this is the same, uh, the same lattice, but you, but you know, as input data without a picture, uh, it's, it's hard to immediately see. But if we're concerned, con um, concerned with real world structures as well, things get a little bit slipperier in that we may not be interested in reflection because reflection isn't necessarily a thing you can actually do with a lattice. You can't lift it out of its dimension and flip it around. So we as well, so we might care about this. We might say these two lattices are the same. We might ask whether these two lattices, which are related by uh, by a reflection um, in in the in, in an axis. Um, are the same. Are, do we want them to be close together or do we want them to be far apart? So already we've started to introduce some complications here. Um, and again, just to point, make the point that, as Vitaly mentioned, that the fairly, that, that, you know, immediately a, a lot of kind of crystal people with crystal graphic background, well, 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 the basis problem is easy. We just pick one. We just take a rule, we pick a canonical basis. And these, these are through sort of processes known as, as reductions. We mentioned the knee reduced cell, uh, selling reductions. We kind of pick essentially, we use our algorithm to pick something geometrically. So for example, here we're interested and we'll be interested throughout this talk um, in saying, well, we want the basis Who's, uh, who, where the angles between the two vectors uh, are obtuse, so they have a negative inner product, say, uh, but we want them to be as close to uh, 290 degrees as we can get. Okay, that's a, that's a nice pick, it's a perfectly standard pick, uh, but here's a lattice with, um, uh, here's one lattice, uh, where that pick gives us this, this kind of almost square thing here, because of course this is close to, um, this is close to uh, 90 degrees. But if I nudge one of the basis vectors here, and I still care about having an obtuse angle, then suddenly we pop out to a new basis here, which is very different. So if we've got, so if we're, again, if we're looking at the data of the, um, of the lattice itself, uh, if we've just got the things to go on, it's going to, we're going to kind of shift this and it's going to look very different. So um, how then do we kind of nail down a lattice? And it turns out that what you need is you need to go kind of one layer out in the lattice to nail a lattice. So we've got this, these infinite structures, but what we're going to show as we go on, um, and this is, this is based on some work uh, by Conway, which I'll, I'll refer to in a moment, which is the, the kind of paper we fundamentally revisited and realized could be developed into a metric for lattices with a, with a bit of further investigation uh, is that um, what we need really is the quotient lattice sort of what we call lambda two lambda. So all combinations so where the, of integer vectors where the integers are in just Z2, um, the, so one and zero, so sums. So for example, in two dimensions, uh, in, for a two dimensional lattice, we've got this infinite lattice, you can imagine it going out here, but our quotient lattice is this very simple little beast here with, um, Oh, with a single point, we might as well put it to the origin, as I've mentioned, uh, surrounded by a single kind of layer of the, of the point structure. Um, and the reason we need that is because what we're going to base this all on is this thing called the Voronoi cell. 
uh, of, of a point, or specifically the point at the origin. Uh, now, the Voronoi cell of a point in a lattice is given by the subset of the space in which it's in uh, that consists of all points that are closer to that point than they are to anywhere else. Uh, so, so this is kind of you can see this. Uh, this is kind of a polyhedron in general position. It's it's uh, it's it's kind of hexagonal. Uh, but if we have a rectangular lattice, we it kind of generates to a square. Um, and within the Voronoi cell, the Voronoi cell helps us to define the Voronoi vectors. And the Voronoi vectors are just those vectors uh, whose bisecting planes intersect the Voronoi cell. So on the right here, uh, for this kind of general position lattice, uh, um, as it were, we've got a couple of Voronoi vectors here, um, and uh, and one out here, which is um, as you can see outside the layer. These two these two vectors are inside the layer, as it were, of uh, um, of lambda two lambda, and this vector is. Um, is outside it, and as you can see, these are definitely Voronoi vectors, and these are not. Uh, we say Voronoi vectors are strict if they don't just kind of cross the cell, but if they intersect with a face, so you get strict Voronoi vectors in a um, in a uh, in, in a rectangular cell in two dimensions here. Now, uh, Conway and Sloan in this paper here, which is, I say, the paper we developed on, uh, which is a kind of rather theoretical paper, part of a sequence of, of eight very theoretical papers on lattices in low dimensions, by low, uh, I think I think they got sort of 17 or something. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, one of the, the major things they kind of sit down and prove is that precisely the Voronoi vectors uh, in R2 and R3 are precisely those vectors that live in, uh, in this quotient space. Excuse me, Matt. Yes. Um, I just have a, have a short question about your Voronoi cell in in the right hand picture. Uh, it's not. Yeah, it's not drawn to scale. Okay. Uh, no, because the, the the sides should be perpendicular to yes. the Voronoi vectors. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. And hexagonal. Yeah, it is. It cannot yeah. be hex. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I just want to know whether it's a feature. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. It has to be hexagon. Yes. Uh, so th no, that's an, sorry. That was an error in drawing. So, yeah, hexagon, hexagon, exactly. Yes. Not yeah. octagon. Not octagon. No. No, we have a okay. Sorry. Right. No, but uh, yeah. Okay, I'll correct that in in, in later diagrams. Um. And it turns out the trick you need to fix, um, the, the trick you need to kind of, in, in a sense, fix uh, a canonical choice of lattice is that you need to add one extra uh, Voronoi vector to the lattice. So rather than just having two, which define the lattice, uh, you need this extra one, which is quite simply the negative sum. Of the of the two uh, of the two lattice vectors, this uh, is um, this then becomes what Conway called a superbase. Uh, so a superbase, it's a basis plus the one vector which is the negative sum, and obviously that all kind of lives in the quotient lattice because this is just uh, minus v two minus v one, and the. Uh, we then go on and say that uh, that the lattice is obtuse. If all the uh, the quantities, all the inner products, p, i, j, the negatives are, are sort of, uh, if all the quantities, the inner products are negative, that is all the negatives of the inner products are positive. So we're, we're going to talk about these quantities, p, i, j, which are positive for all i, uh, for, for, for every single inner product between these vectors. So for example, here, uh, this choice of superbase is not uh, is not an obtuse superbase, but this is an obtuse superbase uh, here. And uh, the, the the again, what 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 Conway Sloan go on to prove is that there is only one choice. So so a lattice which admits an obtuse superbase is called the lattice of the first kind. Uh, and and Conway and Sloan proved that it is um, not only the case that in R two and R three in two and three dimensional space all lattices are of the first kind, uh, but that in fact, there's really only up to isomorphism. This is what we're we're kind of uh, working through in detail now. There is really only one choice of obtuse superbase. So this really is so so. Uh, it's hard to choose a stable canonical 
uh, it's hard, hard to choose a suitable canonical, a stable canonical basis, but there really is only one up to isomorphism choice of suitable obtuse superbase. And that obtuse superbase defines a lattice in R2 in general position. Uh, the, so, and, and, and you can kind of, to illustrate this, uh, rather than necessarily to prove it, we can see that in general position, uh, the combination of the V1 and V2 with this V0, the negative sum, uh, cover all of the vectors in, in lambda 2 lambda, essentially, in the, in the, in the quotient space uh, that, that, we can, that we can get to. There's only kind of one, basically we run out of choices uh, for, the, for the ways in which we can choose the super vector. So, it's, so it's, it's one to pick. In the degenerate sort of rectangular case like this, we've got some additional choices. Uh, in that we can decide to pick a super base by uh, with with positive or negative sort of inverted versions of the of, of some of the vectors, uh, but these four choices that we have uh, are all related by uh, by an isometry by a by a reflection or a or a rotation in R two. And the handy thing about this is if we have a super, an obtuse superbase, if indeed we have an obtuse, a superbase in general, there's a nice uh, relationship between the lengths and the negative inner products, uh, which is expressed here. So we can just add so, so uh, the, uh, so we're defining, so we'll see this VI squared a lot. This is just shorthand again, so that we can avoid a lot of um, arrows and, and, and dots and brackets and things. VI squared is shorthand for the squared norm, so the squared length. Uh, of of uh, the vectors of the superbase, uh, and these are just kind of sums. We can express each. You can show that this can be expressed in terms of sums of the negative inner products. So v naught squared is v one plus v naught two, for example. Um, and similarly, you can get back from the uh, from the inner products to the uh, to you can get to the inner products or the negative inner products from the squared lengths. Uh, so they have this kind of neat relationship. Um, and we, we define, uh, or, or following, following Conway, we call these, uh, these squared lengths vonorms and the inner products co-norms. Co For reasons that will become clear uh, as, as we go on, uh, the idea is that we arrange the vonorm and co-norm values uh, into these dual triangular graphs called the VO form and the CO form. So we take the V0, V1, V2, and we arrange it round. We take the inverted triangle here uh, just purely as a kind of a mnemonic convenience because it looks like it looks a bit like a V. Um, and so we take the the, the triangle here and place um, the the dual uh, CO norms around this triangle. In fact, what we actually do uh, when we're doing calculations with this, we take the root form. So we take the square roots of all of these. Uh, and the really the only reason we do that is because when we display these results, as you'll, uh, as, 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 as you'll see later, uh, we, we sometimes want to, to have some nice units. And obviously we work all through the units of this. Uh, then if we're using actual side lengths given by crystallographic data, the root form has units in angstroms. Which, which, which kind of makes a nice bit of sense. So the question is, okay, all right, there's only one obtuse uh, superbase, how do you find it? Uh, well, there's kind of a procedure, there is a, a reduction procedure, uh, which you can do, is easier to see when you do it forward, but in fact, what you do is you do it purely by manipulating the co-forms um, here. So suppose we have a, uh, a non-obtuse uh, uh, superbase. Uh, we do this. So at each step, we take one of the vectors involved in the uh, in the sort of bad conorm value, and we invert it. Okay. So we take v1, we take this new u1, which is minus v1, and we leave the other one that where it is. And it's obviously easy to see in this particular case that we've immediately created a, a, an obtuse angle. And then we calculate, recalculate um, our u0, our additional superbase vector, which is actually in terms of the original vector, it's v2 minus v1. We have this here. Uh, so we can see immediately that we found, sort of visually, that we found a, uh, a superbase. But we want to be able to do this in terms of, of vo forms and co forms. So we just track through what actually happens here uh, using these useful relationships. 
Uh, and what actually happens is something rather neat. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the offending, um, so if you say this, this value here is negative, the offending negative uh, value flips and the other two um, increase by the value of that, uh, that negative, uh, that, that negative version. Um, and what that does to the Vaux form, so what, what that does to the squared length is that two of them stay the same, and this one here, and you can sort of see it visually, uh, drops by uh, four times the, the offending negative value, as it were. So as we, we keep going round, if we, if, if we kind of, if we started with something very acute out here, uh, then things would have kind of shortened dramatically, and we might need another, but we might need another, another round of this. But every time we go around it, uh, we're keeping every vector the same, but we're shortening one of them. So the kind of proof that this algorithm, this process terminates, is essentially we will eventually get to the shortest, uh, the, the sort of shortest possible set of vectors, um, as it were. So there, there's kind of a flaw uh, to this process in two dimensions. And the handy thing about putting this on a triangle, and this kind of uh, ex expresses uh, one of the reasons why we do it, and also because when we extend three dimensions, as you'll see shortly, we get a slightly more complicated structure, um, is that there's a, a neat... So if we want to get isometries of this basis, uh, then the isometries of the basis are reflected by isometries of the triangle. Uh, so a rotation of this basis essentially a relabeling of the, of the, of the vectors, uh, becomes a rotation of the triangle, and a reflection becomes a reflection of the triangle. So we can see the different permutations. We can kind of tell whether the, an, isometry, an isometry of the superbase, what, and the, what we're looking at is, uh, is a reflection or a rotation, because we can look at the permutations um, of the conorms on the triangle. We generally tend to take the conorms rather than the, the vonorms, because they're kind of, they're, they're, simpler to, to display and calculate, um, and because we, um, we then have a nice algorithm for working this through. So all of this works backwards. So if I have a, if I just perform this calculation uh, on, on a cohort which has a negative value in it, I can, I can keep going uh, around and I know that what I'm actually doing up here in the, in the realm of the picture uh, is, is inverting various vectors until I get down to my minimal, uh, my minimal obtuse superbase, my, my obtuse superbase here. And because we can see all of these isometries, so we want to get a distance between these two, b b between, uh, between, say, two dimensional lattices to start with, and we get that distance, uh, we can, you know, just treat the three values of the, of the conorms as a vector and measure a a metric distance between them, a sort of standard uh, Minkowski metric. But of course, we need to take into account the fact that there are a number of isometric bases. So this is what we do. We just say that we have all the permutations of the conorms of one lattice. Um, we take the distance between one lattice and all the permutations of the conorms of the other. And then we take the minimum. And we can prove, and we will be proving in our showing in our forthcoming paper that these uh, that this is a metric. It's obviously it inherits the kind of metricness of the Minkowski metric, uh, and the minimization process um, is is the only thing you you have to work with. But this is essentially um, uh, this is what we do. And if we want to care about rotations, if we want to turn off, if we, if we want to say rotations are not the same. Uh, then we just take the orientation preserving distance, which is just the minimum restricted to the to the cyclic. So we can take the so the, the groups of symmetries of the triangle are no more and no less than the kind of permutation group S3. And then if we take the cyclic permutation subgroup, we have an orientation preserving distance. And that gives us uh, that gives us if we care about, uh, so as I say, we're using general root coform values. So to calculate it here, um, if we have a uh, if we have a vector here, if, if we have a lattice here with a super base looks like this, and we reflect it in the x-axis, uh, you can see that what happens to this coform down here and what happens to the conorms is a reflection precisely in the uh, in the axis going through the unchanged the point representing the unchanged vector, as it were, 
and uh, the orientation preserving distance can then be calculated and it's non-zero. So if we sort of stick to the cyclic uh, permutations, then we can spot that these two lattices are different. So hopefully that's um, that's clear in two dimensions. It's very clear in two dimensions. Uh, it, 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 it's kind of visually clear in two dimensions. It's rather harder to see in three. Uh, but what happens here is that if we look at the, you can still say that we live in the quotient lattice, but the quotient lattice contains uh, some extra vectors. So the, uh, the VO norms here, we take the four squared lengths of the super base vectors and also sort of partial sums. So we, so we have, v, in, in here we have V0, V1, V2, and V3, and then we take the partial sums. Well, we can take V12, V23, V13, but if you kind of work out because of the value of V0, uh, we can also take V01, V02, V03, and they're just the negatives. Uh, they're just the negatives here. So, so an obtuse superbase looks like this in two dimensions, and it looks like this in, in, in three dimensions. Well, this is not necessarily obtuse. But the relationships between uh, squared norms, squared VO norms, uh, between VO norms and co, co norms, so squared lengths and negative inner products, uh, still apply, although we have to, we, we, we have to have kind of a, a uh, an expression for these partial sums, so vij, so v, uh, v12. But still we have these nice simple relationships um, uh, and the, you know, you can work out the, the conal values from the vonal values uh, as you do in, in R2, indeed R, it works in, in, in Rn. Uh, so, um, so we have this nice simple relationship. Uh, in three dimensions, your general Voronoi cell here is a, um, is so again rather harder to illustrate than the diagram you saw earlier but we have this kind of general Voronoi cell as a truncated octahedron kind of fully defined by these eight vectors um and if um if we have some some uh sort of degenerate cases where the inner products are zero that is we've got some uh some orthogonal uh Voronoi vectors uh then the, uh, then we get some parallel edges of face shrinking to zero. And then there, there are kind of, you get the same situation as you do in the two dimensional case. There are some more vector choices, but again, you can show that they are all uh, isometric. So when you've got an obtuse superbase defined by the, uh, uh, the, the Voronoi vectors, you can get, uh, you, you, you know, you've only got one choice up to isometry. In, uh, in R3, uh, we've got these. Um, well, obviously, if you include the partial sums, we've got we've got seven. Uh, we've got we've got we've got seven possible quantities. Um, and where you place them again, following following Conway here, is that we put them on uh, on this kind of graph here. Now, those of you who are familiar with projective geometry over finite fields will recognise the Stefano plane. Uh, the uh, the is the, the projective plane over over points in in Z two, but for our purposes, uh, they, they, it kind of has some nice uh, geometric sort of graph properties, which we're going to be using to uh, to illustrate how both the reduction process works and how we can kind of again the question is how do we permute uh, values of of conorms coforms um, conorms to get a a valid distance uh, that is invariant under that is isometry invariant or that, that, that respects isometries. Um, and again, we place, we, we, uh, the, this graph has its dual, we place the VO norms here, we place the conorms. There's a, there's a rather odd thing here because we have, we have seven VO norms, but only six conorms. And the, and the convention is that, well, it is, well the, for reasons that you'll, you'll see in a second, we place uh, the, uh, the, co the conorms around the edge and we place this kind of zero at this central vertex where the, Initially, the, the the v zero, so the negative sum of all vectors, appears in the um, uh, in in the vo form. So again, this is a vo form. This is a co form, uh, just in in three dimensions. And as an example, you can see here, this is uh, body centered cubic, face centered cubic. These are a couple of kind of simple lattices, and you can see the kind of degeneracies that appear. So in body centered cubic, you you don't get because the, the obtuse superbase doesn't have any um, any right angles, 
uh, but you can see the kind of the generous is the symmetries in the fact that in the co-form, all the values of, uh, of the inner products are the same, uh, with, uh, which isn't necessarily the case for face centered cubic, where you can see that there are some, uh, there are some uh, orthogonal, orthogonal vectors. So this is just an example of what a, a Bowform coform pair might look like. And again, there's a, there's kind of a, 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 a reduction process for finding the obtuse superbase uh, through a series of, of, of vector changes. And, and again, the, the diagram gets rather hard to visualize here, but we do the same thing. We have an issue with a uh, with with two uh, vectors that, that are not don't have an obtuse angle between each other. Their inner product is uh, is positive. Then we flip that vector. And recalculate, um, recalculate all the. We flip that vector. We keep the other vector where it is, and we recalculate all the other uh, partial sums and, and the v zero from that. And again, we can chase through what happens to the bonorms and conorms in this case, and the uh, and uh, and and what happens here is once again all of the squared lengths of the vectors, all of the bonorms stay the same, um, except for one. Which reduces by um, which reduces by uh, four times the kind of offending negative value, and over here there's kind of a rebalancing process, and this actually corrects what appears to be uh, a typo in uh, in in Conway's paper, where he claims that what happens to the offending in a product is that it becomes zero if you actually trace through all the sums. Uh, which are not done explicitly in the paper, then what actually happens is it becomes the negative as we get for the, um, so, so this becomes positive, the negative of the original negative, which becomes positive, uh, which, uh, which is the, similar to the two-dimensional version. And then, and again, this is where we get the nice kind of geometric properties of the coform helping us. What happens is that the, the collinear value passing through this zero uh, co uh, zero co-norm uh, is, uh, is kind of increases, that is we subtract the negative version uh, by P12 and everything else decreases. So we decrease, uh, we decrease all the other co-forms, all the other co-norms by adding this, this negative value. So again, we can go in the reduction process, you just do this backwards. You can kind of, uh, so, so you keep going round if you spot a negative, uh, a negative co uh, uh, co-norm, uh, you just perform this reduction on the whole co-form, uh, you can be sure that the, uh, the vo form is going to do the same thing, and ultimately the, uh, the, um, all that's going to happen is that your single, uh, your, one of your squared lengths is going to reduce, so once again we can, we, we can show that eventually you're going to reach uh, some minimum. This this algorithm is going to terminate, and you'll get your Q superbase. So we said there's some isometry. So we need to explore the isometry so that we understand. Uh, so we need to explore kind of isometries of superbases. Uh, so exchange uh, changes in superbases uh, to see what kind of permutations we get on on coforms. Um, and the idea is that if I exchange a couple of vo norms here, uh, what happens is uh, if so if I if I kind of uh, what happens is uh, that the conorm diagram kind of essentially uh, reflects as it does. So if I if I kind of exchange a couple of vo norms here, if you keep your eye on this, it's easier to see for face centered. If you keep your eye on this uh, uh, this kind of purple line here. Uh, which represents the three zero values. Um, if you swap things around, that purple line uh, goes over here. So the, the shift in the, the the shift when you swap everything around, when you kind of follow it all through, uh, uh, kind of reflects in one of the axes. And kind of if you do it again, what you've got is a kind of a central inversion of the two of the two vectors. So you've got a, a kind of isometry there, and you get a you get a rotation uh, just to. I don't know how much time I've got here. Um, so the point is that uh, we can we can reflect isometries uh, in the in in the obtuse superbase uh, 
by uh, by sort of rotations or reflections by symmetry operations on the coform. And you can see this here illustrated. This is the illustration that will this kind of summary that will appear in our paper. Uh, if I um, so, so there are three ways of representing this. This is obviously quite awkward to represent. So we, what we tend to do is we tend to condense this down to a two by a th two by three matrix in which the columns represent opposing points. Um, incidentally, what happens if you trace through this zero, uh, this zero co co norm? It kind of remains zero across every single um, across every single manipulation. So uh, the uh, the so yeah. So, so you can kind of trace this through here. I won't go through it in detail, but if I if I swap, say one and two, and um, this is uh, this is what's important here. Obviously, the partial sums change, so I can't just flip these. Uh, I've also got to flip these because v v one three the partial sum v one plus v three becomes v two plus three three, and so on and so forth. So if I swap one and two, this uh, this changes. Um, and you can see what happens is that we have a sort of permutation of uh, of the columns. So the the columns permute, uh, but uh, nothing happens to the rows. If I swap the central, the v zero vector with v one, then we get uh, we we get a changed row norm again. And you see what happens bow form again. Um, and you can see that there's a kind of slightly different set of changes going on. The the middle things stay where they are, but um, everything everything else moves around. And uh, and what we get here is both a, um, a a permutation of columns. So effectively, we can think of this as the action of a, of the permutation group S three on the columns, and then a, a swap, a diagonal swap of uh, of of two the two rightmost columns here, and that really the, that really kind of covers the uh, the permutations of coforms, which is what we originally set out to, or the, the permutations of conal values expressed in this matrix that uh, we um, that, that that we can have that actually reflect genuine isometries in a uh, in an obtuse superbase. So we express, as I say, the coform as a matrix. In fact, we use uh, often use the root forms for angstroms, um, and then we say that a superbase isometry is reflected by a permutation of columns, potentially followed by a row swap for the rightmost two elements, uh, which is either diagonal or um, uh, or sort of parallel, as it were. So it's a combination of S three and actually the, the Klein group, um, in a sense, on this uh, on, on this arrangement. Uh, and to show you what happens when we try and kind of do illegitimate swaps, as it were, this is something that we were we, we've been investigating when we when we spoke uh, um, when when we came across sort of Larry Andrews and uh, Andrews and Bernstein's um, uh, uh, side length based metric um, is to look at what happens when you kind of apply an illegitimate swap of sides to this. So we look at the same. So we so what we do here. For example, as we take this uh, this row form and we swap essentially uh, two vectors, we swap uh, v two three and v one two, but we don't move anything else. And obviously, that's kind of illegitimate because if I've swapped uh, v one with v two and v two with v three uh, in the in the obtuse superbase, and I should be moving other things around as well, but I'm not. Uh, and you can kind of if you look at what happens to the coform uh, from our relationships, we get something very different. Um, and so the, the, the coforms look different. And if we reconstruct the lattices, which we can do directly from this, because uh, you can see how they, uh, uh, they all relate, then you can see that these are two non-isometric lattices. Two of the vectors remain the same, and the other does not. But of course, all the list of distances, the ordered list of distances, remains the same. And indeed, you can you can carry on with this as a family of distinct. Uh, you you can sort of if I add, if I kind of define an addition on coforms as just adding vertex wise, 
uh, then I can kind of add, I can create a family of, of these things uh, by adding, um, uh, by kind of adding, adding any coform to, to both and you'll, you'll still get the same, uh, you'll still get the same issue unless of course I accidentally symmetrize my underlying uh, obtuse superbase by adding, um, adding um, sort of the relevant factors to, to kind of uh, not change to, to make the same, make two different conal values the same. So then we can define the coform distance as the, uh, again, using a Minkowski metric, as the minimum distance between all of the coform permutations that we've defined. So this is a slight wrinkle in that in, in R2, we just take the permutation group on three or the, perm, or the, the cyclic subgroup. Here, we've got to take a kind of slightly awkward subgroup. We can't just take the permutation group on all six coforms. We've got to take those particular permutations, which represent isometries of the superbase, which represent kind of legitimate uh, swaps of bone norm values. Uh, so uh, we take the minimum over all coform permutations. Um, and it turns out that the way to then take away the reflections is that the column permutation element of that uh, is, is restricted only to cyclic elements of, of S3. Uh, so, so then we get the orientation preserving distance. Um, and we've got algorithms that calculate all of this. So we can start to look at some results. So we have, uh, and the handy thing about this is, as you can imagine, this is all just inner products. This is all just sort of vectorized operations. So we've got some Python code, which works with this. Um, and uh, the, one of the things we did was hit up the, uh, the Cambridge Structural Database. Uh, now, we, because uh, this, we're interested in lattices, we wanted to avoid disorder. Uh, we, we wanted to dis disorder and some ambiguity. So we wanted to kind of have the cleanest possible, the simplest possible crystal. So while Vitaly has said um, that there are over a million uh, crystals in the Cambridge Structural Database, uh, we've got kind of just about sort of 870,000 uh, that definitely have no disorder um, in them and that have kind of uh, clearly and unambiguously assigned uh, lattices. Uh, uh, and so taking those, uh, you can calculate these vo norms and these vo forms and coforms uh, takes uh, two or three hours on, on my uh, aging MacBook. Uh, so we can rummage through that in, in, in a couple of hours. Uh, and uh, we can then kind of look at, uh, at some plots. So if we take the two shortest sides of orthorhombic lattices and just, just plot them against each other. Um, so, so if you take an orthorhombic lattice, uh, then actually the, if it's a primitive orthorhombic lattice, the, the roots, um, uh, the, the, you'll find the root coforms are really just the side lengths. Um, and if you take the two side lengths there and, and, and plot them, you can see, um, so, so this is just a scatter plot of kind of 145,000 primitive orthorhombic coforms uh, with their, their, you know, two of their root, root conorm values. Um, and you can see they're ordered so that we, we, we don't have anything so, so RO2 is in general larger than, than RO1. Um, and you can start to see a little bit of structure here. You might speculate, for example, you can see that if you've got very big cells out here, they tend to lie along the light. So, you know, I'd like to do, if, if you want to be, if you want to be a very big orthorhombic crystal cell, do you want to be more cubic or do you want to have, a, do, do you want your, your side lengths to be, to be more equal? Whereas um, if you're if you've got kind of unequal side lengths here, um, you're kind of a little the, the total side length is a little smaller. Um, so visualizing these things is a bit of a is is in general a bit unless you've got some very simple things like orth orthorhombics or tetragonals or or, or monoclinics or like so, sorry not monoclinics we'll get to monoclinics in a second uh, then visualizing these things is quite tricky uh, but given non-negative root values what well, one thing we can do is we can kind of project a barycentric coordinates so since all of these are non-negative uh, so so sort of by by, by their definition, and they're all living in the kind of in one particular octant, and we we can project this to uh, uh, to kind of barycentric coordinates uh, in the unit triangle. Um, 
And uh, because we've got some kind of legitimate permutations and we can make sure that RO1 is, is greater than RO2, we can make sure that, uh, that actually uh, all, of our, all of these barycentric coordinates live within a particular segment uh, of that of that triangle so we can so this is kind of a handy way of exploring the space certainly in two dimensions of lattices in three dimensions it's a little harder to see uh, and what you end up with is this nice kind of canonical what we're calling the canonical triangle uh, and there's a kind of a lovely sort of geometric relationship here where if you sit right at the top here where everything's equal you're looking at a hexagonal lattice um, as you move down here you're looking at kind of um, uh, sort of face centered uh, square lattices or, or centered square lattices. Uh, right down here, we've got square lattices. And out here, we kind of get progressively more and more impossible. Things get progressively kind of longer and flatter, um, as it were, until we, we kind of reach this point here. Uh, and we can then take sort of orthorhombic coforms, we can take um, P01, uh, P02 and P03 and plot this. And we can look at the density plot. So this is the plot you saw on um, Vitali's slides uh, earlier of the density plot of the values of, of, um, of RO1, RO2 and RO3. So this is just all of these 145,000. This is a count of lattices in a 200 by 200 uh, grid within this canonical triangle. And I suppose, again, what you can see is there is this blank thing here out to the out to the end. These are kind of crystals that really it would be hard to imagine existing in the real world because they'd be very squashed. Um, but you can perhaps see a little bit of structure. There's little density. Uh, there's this little kind of island of density here. Uh, but in general, what it says is that everything is um, uh, the, the, the whole space is covered. It's, it's kind of um, there are even among this this kind of selection from CSD, uh, you, there, there are points everywhere. There are no there are less dense spots perhaps, but no blank spots. Um, and we can also so the the other visualization we can do is by kind of projecting say monoclinics down to uh, down to their kind of non orthogonal uh, square cells. So we can project along the axis normal to the plane in which the single non-orthogonal angle of the crystal lies and uh, and thus plot points again in the canonical triangle using our two-dimensional uh, coforms uh, that we've spoken of earlier and you can see here this is just an initial uh, result which is the projection again there's rather a lot of monoclinics in the CSD there's about sort of 375,000 um, and you can see here that it is kind of everything is covered. This is not a density map, this is just a straight scatter plot, kind of everything is covered, except out at this, this point here, which is what we would expect, because this is, as I said, bar barycentric coordinates are quite, uh, you know, we, we get quite a lot of distortion out here, and what this represents is a space of kind of extremely long uh, acute angle crystals of the sort that you you just just wouldn't be physically realistic and uh the, these these down here are sort of very flat as it were so you can see that that as we approach these in sort of physically awkward shapes uh we don't we don't see any 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 crystals so that's that uh and uh hopefully you uh you have a few questions Thank you very much, Matt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Matt and Peter, we are a bit late. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I don't... Yeah. But, yeah. but yes, uh, I guess there will be some questions. So could you share your slides again? And if you have, yeah, uh, yeah Larry, sorry, <laughs> Larry, you're a hero. <laughs> so you're in Berkeley, yeah. right? <laughs> Middle of the night. It is. Oh, please, your question first, of course. Uh, it wasn't really a question. Uh, in looking at obviously related.